Hello everyone, I welcome each one of you to my channel and to this new series which uh, starts today. Um, Alright, so I had talked about what I uh, have in my vision about this new series. So this is an extension of uh, me and my, uh, you know, way of understanding things. Uh, so I will be sitting for the June um, net exams for um, assistant professor. So uh, I would not be sitting for the JRF. Uh, so that is why uh, I'm doing this, uh, you know, video series so that this gives me an opportunity to learn. And uh, this also gives me an opportunity to reach out to hundreds and thousands of those students who are aspiring to uh, give net exams and clear them. So I'm one of uh, all of these uh, candidates who wants to be in the academic scenario and uh, clear the net exams. So anyways, um, I would be speaking about uh, today teaching aptitude and um, the, the kind of research I have done about what kind of you know questions come um, and in the recent times there has been uh, a few changes which has been incorporated so uh, I have also read through the recent uh, question papers um, so that is how I have structured a sort of um, way in which I am uh, you know starting to read and understand the concepts of teaching aptitude so this is basically from paper one so paper one can be um, you know useful to anyone whoever is uh, interested to give uh, net exams so uh, I think everyone can uh, get a little bit of uh, information from this video um, I would also be you know um, speaking about the folk literature because I will be sitting for folk literature as my paper too. So we'll be doing that as well. Um, and uh, I have a proper plan. How am I supposed to, you know, uh, do do both both the things together? Uh, because uh, only if you're concentrating on your own paper, I mean, on paper two, uh, you lose out on a lot of important concepts. And, uh, um, you know, clearing the paper one is also very important. And it's also very, um, you can gain a lot of marks from there. So I think that that is one important thing why I started off with paper uh, one, uh, because first I did not know anything about it so I had to you know uh, do proper studies and research and uh, read a lot about it and um, I scanned all of the recent question papers uh, so that was a you know long long work uh, I did and um, I wanted to share the syllabus uh, for uh, paper one first uh, because that is the most important thing and one should know before one uh, starts to prepare for an exam so I'm sharing my screen So as you can see, this is the paper one syllabus. It has 10 chapters or 10 uh, main topics which we need to focus on. Uh, one is uh, teaching aptitude, research aptitude, comprehension, communication, mathematical reasoning and aptitude. And then we go to the next uh, number six is logical reasoning. Then data interpretation, people uh, development and environment, information and communication technology, higher education system. So this is all about it. This is the whole syllabus. Um, I have, uh, you know, started reading off with a teaching aptitude, which is the first one. Um, so moving forward, um, today's, uh, you know, uh, discussion would be based on teaching aptitude. And I would be covering three subtopics uh, in teaching aptitude. One is teaching, second is learner's characteristics, and the third is factors affecting teaching. So here you can see, nature and characteristics of teaching. So here you can, uh, you know, see it is scattered a little bit and uh, I have uh, uh, found out certain characteristics or nature which is related with teaching, the social process, formal and informal teaching, teaching as a planned activity, teaching as an art and science, teaching as a skilled profession, teaching as a social service, teaching as an interactive process. So I would be speaking about each of the uh, so I will be speaking about each of the topics a little bit in details and um, I would not be able to, you know, delve into it uh, really because of um, the, the, you know, breadth of the things. So in case, you know, you are, uh, you know, beginning the journey like me, uh, you will have to really scan through these uh, subtopics and uh, research for yourself um, and see what kind of questions come uh, from these, um, you know, topics, subtopics as well. Uh, teaching as a social process uh, because it takes place in a very social setup and it has a very specific objective. And the main objective is to make the students um, actually more culturally, morally, socially acceptable. And uh, next we come to the bo both formal and informal teaching styles. So it can be both uh, like a formal system in which we go to a you know educational institution, educational board, and then we pass the you know examinations and uh, go to the next uh, class or next standard. Um, there is informal educations as well, and education as well, because uh, what we learn at home by our mother or by our parents, 
students uh, or uh, with the help of our peers or with the help of um, uh, the, the society. That is also informal. So teaching can be both formal and informal. It can be outside the classroom, inside the classroom as well. <laughs> teaching is an art as well as in science. So uh, science has a scientific basis, uh, a particular way of learning. Uh, it has got this science into it. So yes, teaching does have certain scientific elements, certain techniques, certain procedures, but it also definitely has uh, a very subjective uh, way of uh, you know understanding or you know sharing their own perspective to the others. So uh, it's um, on one hand it's a science, on the other hand it's also an art. Now we come to uh, training as a skilled profession. So uh, trainings or teachings, um, you know, now we come to teaching as a skilled profession. So uh, teaching is a profession in which um, a successful uh, teacher is expected to be skilled and knowledgeable. And, um, you know, uh, one requires a rigorous training uh, to improve uh, each one's uh, qualifications or uh, polish uh, oneself uh, to become a teacher. So now we move on to teaching as a planned activity. So certainly it has a, a particular planned objective, outcome, uh, a planned lesson plan, uh, you know, how you are supposed to um, understand a, a particular uh, concept and uh, share the concept to others, to, the, to your students. Uh, all of that is pre-planned. So um, also the evaluation is pre-planned. So you can say that teaching is a planned activity. Um, now we move on to teaching as a social service. Yes, it's a social responsibility of the teacher to teach the students um, moral lessons social uh, cultural lessons and um, certainly it is so socially uh, taken or understood as a social service teaching uh, is also you know a very noble profession it is said so yeah it definitely comes under teaching as a social service um, and teaching as an interactive process uh, teaching is not one-sided it's um, on one hand the teacher is teaching but on the other hand the teacher is also learning something from the students and uh, through the discussion which is happening in the class so it's always an interactive process uh, in which the teacher is teaching uh, so uh, I think I, I, I can sum up uh, this slide like this because the more I go into it the more deeper it gets and um, I'm sure you know this is not enough but then uh, a lot of questions actually come uh, later later this uh, how uh, you know the teaching process is or what are the teaching aids are uh, what are what is the learning process is like or the learning theories or teaching theories so we'll move on to that because those are more important part of the uh, syllabus uh, let's move on so here in this slide you can see the models of teaching which i have uh, mentioned pedagogy andragogy and pedagogy so what is pedagogy Ped pedagogy is a teaching model and um, this uh, teaching model is centered around the instructor or the teacher and uh, the teacher decides what is the method uh, like or uh, like what uh, one teacher is supposed to uh, share or communicate their knowledge with their uh, student. A teacher decides that. So it's more, you know, teacher centric. Uh, then we go on to the andragogy. Andragogy is, uh, you know, um, is a combination in which teacher plays a passive role and not, uh, you know, uh, not said as a, you know, leader in the classroom. Uh, the teacher is an assistant and helping as a, you know, guidance or helping hand or support or scaffolding the students uh, through the concepts and um, lesson plans. So um, now we come to pedagogy. So that is a self-determined learning or you can say self-learning. It is more um, learner centric and it depends more on the learners, how one is supposed to, um, you know, initiate the learning process and how they would be taking it forward. Uh, so that is something uh, which comes under pedagogy. To understand it in a proper way, you can say, uh, you can break the three uh, models of teaching uh, into different sectors, like uh, one is learner-centric, one is, uh, you know, mix of both, and another is uh, more teacher-centric. Uh, who is more dependent? Um, that you can find that out. Like in pedagogy, uh, the students are more dependent on the teacher. Andragogy, uh, you know, both are hand-holding, sort of, and uh, pedagogy, teacher is... Um, not, uh, you know, completely uh, independent, but then uh, students are also not, uh, you know, very much dependent on the teacher. Then the role of the teacher is uh, to be acknowledged here in different models of teaching. Also, uh, the focus of learning is on whom. That, by that also, you can understand this. Uh, the, the, what kind of resources are used uh, in learning? Uh, that can be uh, a thing which you can, um, you know, uh, characterize in understanding pedagogy, andragogy, and um, uh, pedagogy. Uh, then, uh, participation of the learners, uh, what kind of participation learners have in each of them, you can you know, characterize that as well. So that will give you a very uh, uh, differentiative um, idea of uh, what uh, the three models of teaching are actually. Moving on, uh, we would be 
<clears throat> moving on to the levels of teaching now. So uh, there are three basic levels of teaching, which you can see uh, over in the slide. First is memory level teaching. Second is understanding level teaching. And third is reflective level teaching. So let's uh, try to understand that what are these levels of teaching. And uh, when I'm speaking about level, um, uh, it surely, you know, uh, makes us understand that uh, these are steps steps in which we realize that what is the most higher level of teaching and what is the lower level of teaching. So um, let's uh, move on to memory level teaching. What is memory level? By the word memory, we can understand that it is uh, about memorizing stuff. So when you're not thoughtful about certain things and you're just memorizing stuff, you are, uh, you know, uh, teaching yourself uh, in a level of teaching, which is the uh, least um, thoughtful, you can say, uh, and uh, you, you're not using your um, cognitive abilities at that point of time, you're just memorizing. And that is memory level teaching. So that has been uh, the, uh, the pro main proponent is um, uh, Hebat. So the, the theory is given by Hebat. Now we move on to uh, the second level, which is understanding level. So um, understanding level uh, is a higher quality than the memory level in which you uh, are more thoughtful than MLT, for sure. And uh, you try to understand or recognize certain principles, certain concepts, and um, reflect uh, their own cognitive abilities, uh, the learner's cognitive abilities. Um, so here, students and teacher both play a very important role in uh, discussing the concepts and understanding uh, the concepts, basically. Uh, this um, was basically, uh, the main proponent was uh, Morrison, and uh, he gave this theory of uh, understanding level teaching. Then we move forward to the next one, which is reflective level teaching. Now, reflective level teaching is not only understanding or identifying certain concepts, but also uh, reflecting on the real life situations and um, uh, finding out situations uh, which are you know likely to happen or you know imagine uh, certain situation, abstract situations, and uh, find out solutions of the problems. So, um, giving uh, solutions uh, using your cognitive abilities. Um, so, Hunt uh, was a main proponent of uh, reflective level teaching and. You can say that this is the highest level of teaching in which a learner not only you know understands identifies a concept but also reflects on it but also so uh, try to solve the problems in uh, the real life situations from it so now we move on to certain objectives of teaching uh, so here you can see acquisition of knowledge nurturing development overall development fostering independence and motivating students so these are few of the objectives of teaching Bloom's taxonomy. Now, uh, a lot of questions have come from Bloom's ta taxonomy, and I think that uh, is supposed to be one of the very important uh, topics or subtopics, whatever you say, in this. And, uh, you know, reading or understanding this thoroughly is very important. So, uh, basically, it's not about MLD. You don't need to memorize stuff. You just need to understand the concept. And uh, whenever, you know, question comes, it, it is very concept-based. The questions are very concept-based and not uh, something which you can memorize. Uh, yes, certain things which you need to memorize, which I will, uh, you know, uh, share right now in the next slide, probably. So, uh, so there are certain teaching and instruction objectives and which have been classified by uh, by, by uh, Bloom's uh, taxonomy. Uh, there are three domains, major domains in which uh, this uh, whole classification works. One is the cognitive domain, second is the affective domain, and third is psychomotor domain. So cognitive domain uh, of Bloom uh, taxonomy focuses on developing intellectual skills and critical thinking, problem solving, then uh, creating a knowledge base. And uh, there are two versions of it. One is uh, 1956 version, and uh, that is a noun uh, version. And now in 2001, there has been another version which has come up, uh, which is uh, the verb uh, there are a little bit changes here and there, but then that is you know more uh, up to the, up to date. And uh, the two thousand one model, I will be uh, sharing with you in the next slide <clears throat> to understand the cognitive domain. Um, now we come to affective domain. So affective domain describes the emotional reactions of the learners, and it deals with learners' attitudes, their values, their interests, their intelligence, and their willingness to participate. So uh, that domain uh, basically functions in five levels, which I'll come very soon back to that. Um, next is psychomotor domain. Psychomotor domain is mostly action-oriented domain of Bloom's taxonomy, and um, it is basically concerned with the motor skills uh, of the learner. Uh, suppose the physical movement or coordination uh, while you are, you know, playing. Say you're playing football. So the coordination of the ball and your leg, or coordination of the other team members with you, that is, uh, that is, th that is skills which you develop within yourselves, right? So that uh, comes from psychomotor domain. Moving forward to uh, explain the cognitive domain better, like I was saying that in 2001, 
a new model was uh, given and this is the new model. Um, so the base starts from remembering. So recalling facts or basic concepts of it and then understanding the basic ideas and concepts and then applying it uh, using in different situations. Then analyzing uh, upon these ideas and then evaluating that whatever, whatever your stand is, whether you judge it that way or this way, then you create or you produce your original work. So this is a uh, cognitive domain under uh, Bloom's taxonomy. If we move to the next one, which is effective domain, um, you can say, see that there is uh, five um, levels. The lowest level is of receiving and then responding and then valuing, organizing and characterization. So when students are receiving something, they're responding to it. They start valuing the concepts or the you know whatever learning capabilities they have according to that. They organize according to their understanding and uh, they characterize themselves accordingly. Uh, so that is effective domain. And um, the next is psychomotor domain in which you imitate. The base is base level is the or the least um, level is uh, imitation, then manipulation, precision, articulation, and naturalization. So the learner tries to imitate. The base level is trying to imitate and then manipulates oneself that okay, this is correct and uh, I think uh, this is better to do. And you rather than you know imitating, you start to manipulate your own mind to understand that uh, okay, this gives me this and this you know good things and uh, this is good for me and you manipulate your mind to do that as a regular uh, job and then comes precision you work on it you, you develop your skills in it and you get precision then you can articulate you can explain uh, your precision or whatever your skill set is you can explain that you can articulate that and last and the final one is naturalization in which it, it becomes your second nature uh, it, it doesn't uh, then belong to a category of skills that becomes your characteristic so that is um, psychomotor domain. Um, now we come to the next part, which is methods of teaching. Here you can see there are two types of methodologies uh, given. One is learner-centric methodology and uh, another one is teacher-centric methodology. So learner-centric uh, methodology is more inquiry-based, problem-based learning, uh, discovery-based learning, uh, case study-based learning. And teaching uh, teacher-centric uh, methodologies are more lecture-based, more one-sided, demonstration-based, or sometimes even you know, te team teaching is also there. So uh, by understanding the methods of learning, we can uh, divide them into these four uh, classification, you can say. Uh, one is lecture method in which the uh, language is free flowing, it's lucid. You are just uh, explaining what you, the, the, the any kind of concepts you are explaining in, in your own free flowing language. You're giving examples, you're citing, uh, you know, people. So that is lecture method. Then we come to flipped classroom in which there is discussions, learner centric. These are more learner centric and blended learning happens in which you are present offline or even uh, present online. Then we come to program learning in which either it can be linear programmed, linearly programmed or um, another way is branched or MCQs in which you uh, solve the MCQs and linear program is there's a particular you know, chapter, you read through it, you answer the questions after that. So that is programmed learning. And the last one is project method in which you learn by doing things. You give projects, uh, you give dissertations to do, you, um, uh, do uh, you give presentations to prepare. So all of that uh, comes under project method. Now we come to learning theories. So learning theories uh, are divided into again three parts. First is stimulus uh, response theories. The second one is cognitive theory. And the third one is social learning theory. So I go into um, each of these um, in a little bit uh, so I'll explain each of these in a, a very short um, few lines, uh, in a very short few pointers, uh, so that you can, you know, get the keywords um, and uh, probably can uh, read from it later on also. Um, <clears throat> so stimulus response theories are these. So basically there are three theories in stimulus response. One is classical conditioning theory. Then there is operant conditioning, con sorry, conditioning theory. Uh, and the third one is Thorndike's law of effect. So the classical conditioning theory is defined as association of one event with another desired event resulting in certain behavior. So there is a case study which uh, was done and uh, uh, there was a dog uh, case study uh, which is there in the classical conditioning in which um, there was a bell which was rang uh, when the dog was hungry and just before the food was given to the dog, uh, the bell uh, used to be rung by uh, the, the scientist, social scientist. And what happened is uh, that became his habit and that became that became his stimulus response that, um, uh, sorry, that became his conditioning uh, that uh, whenever the bell will ring, even if the food is not there, not given to him, he will salivate because he will think that uh, now the food would be given to uh, the dog. So 
uh, that was classical conditioning theory. Uh, the next is op theory of operant uh, conditioning, uh, in which um, it the, the behavior is the function of its consequences. It's, it's given by Skinner and uh, advocated that individuals emit behaviors which are rewarded and do not uh, emit behavior which is not rewarded or punished. So if you uh, give reward to a uh, to someone to do certain things that uh, would you know uh, develop a kind of conditioning that if I do this, I will get rewarded. And uh, if you're punished in doing certain um, actions or things, you would refrain from that. So uh, that is all about operant conditioning theory. And finally, we come to Thorndike's law and effect. So Thorndike's uh, law and effect is uh, basically trial and error method. So there are several responses made to the same situation, right? Uh, so uh, which are accompanied or closely followed by uh, satisfaction or reinforcement will be likely to recur. So wherever we'll get satisfaction or wherever we'll get this kind of reinforcement that, yeah, this is going good, you will be uh, more um, wanting to repeat those uh, actions and um, those are accompanied by or you know more closely followed by discomfort a feeling of discomfort is there in doing certain things uh, or there's a punishment given uh, that would be less likely to recur so you can say that Thorndike's law and effect came first and from Thorndike's law uh, Skinner understood the operant conditioning conditioning theory so these are some other very important theories here uh, which I have not included in my slide, but then just to give you a, you know, a brief um, key points or the words which you can you know, search a little bit and uh, study of your own, because these are also very important theories and could not be included in the breadth of the session. Uh, Jean Piaget's theory of cognitive development, uh, Vygotsky's theory, Kohlberg's theory of model development, concept of paradigm by Thomas Kern. Um, <clears throat> we move on to the so we move on to the next slide, which is factors affecting teaching. And here are a few factors which affects teaching. So teacher being a very important um, person who uh, can affect teaching a lot, uh, it can be related to teacher. So what are the you know, things which can affect a teacher? Uh, one is the writing instructional objectives, organizing the content, uh, creating set of introducing lessons, introduction of a lesson, structuring the classroom questions, question delivery, and its distribution as a whole. In explaining and illustrating examples, uh, using teaching aids and stimulus variations, pacing the lesson, uh, promoting pupil interaction, participation, then um, use of uh, Blackboard or other teaching aids, as I said, uh, then uh, achieving closure of the lesson and giving assignments, evaluating the students um, or the you know progress, evaluating the progress as a whole and uh, diagnosing the learning difficulties which the pupils or the students uh, go through and finally management of the class. So all of this uh, is regardless of the you know uh, fact that teacher has to go through all of these stringent um, uh, pointers to um, develop a you know good uh, teaching experience good learning experience next we come to uh, related to the learner so there are also factors which a learner keeps in mind while uh, the teaching is happening uh, so the psychological and physiological attitude of the learner it generally impacts the learning outcomes and that depends on the learner uh, themselves and uh, the most effective learning is when the differences um, in language or sociocultural behaviors of the learners are kept in mind. And that is a very important factor which a teacher uh, should keep in mind while uh, the learning process is going on. So um, age, maturity level, intelligence, uh, motivation, prior knowledge, ethnic group, socioeconomic background, uh, aspiration and interests. These are certain uh, things which influences the teaching participa uh, participation uh, in the session. Uh, now we move on to related to support material. So there are certain teaching strategies, learning lessons, lessons plans, um, student uh, assessment methods, and uh, effective use of modern ICT, I mean, uh, information and communication technology based on um, you know, certain AI tools are also there nowadays to uh, quiz for the quizzes for uh, making presentations and stuff. So uh, basically, the support materials which are necessary for uh, teaching that are also uh, very important factors in teaching. Then comes instructional facilities in which there are um, audiovisual, audio or you know visual, uh, which are required to you know uh, share in the classroom. Maybe uh, all of these you know technicalities or tools which are uh, used in a certain institution. Um, so facilities are important while you are uh, teaching. Then comes uh, factors related to a uh, learning environment. Again, when we come to the learning environment, how is the learning environment in the classroom? Uh, is everyone getting a chance to speak? Um, physical environment. How is the physical environment? How is the social environment? How is the classroom culture? Uh, uh, what kind of you know outcomes one is planning um, in a classroom session uh, whether is it um, you know boring or is it um, making people anxious you know that that is something which uh, affects uh, learning um, and last but not uh, and last but not least related to institution so uh, there can be different uh, 
uh, you know factors again in the institution um, as there can be varied teacher student ratio teaching methods can be different or you know there could be certain policies uh, certain objectives uh, by the institution uh, which can affect teaching as a whole then a uh, material or physical uh, uh, references or resources which are produced there um, that availability of those are an issue also administrative management and institutional uh, achievements are also uh, very important factors in teaching so here i finish my topics uh, which i covered today and um, this is part 1 of teaching aptitude part 2 is coming soon once the teaching aptitude part 2 is over i will be starting off with the folk uh, literature part as well the paper 2 which i have selected uh, so in case you are also preparing for the same uh, stay tuned and in case you are you have selected any other paper and uh, paper 1 is certainly your general paper uh, you can join me in this journey and uh, do connect to me do comment and let me know um, if there is certain things which i'm missing out on uh, in this particular topic um, those i have covered um any sort of you know um, support or anything which you uh, would want to provide or would need from me i try to help you out um, and uh, equally i would expect uh, from you as well so uh, thank you so much for being through the whole uh, preparation so stay tuned and keep learning with me bye bye